Having three daughters under five means I listen to a lot of Disney music. And of all the songs in the great Disney canon, the one most often requested is, of course, that utter earworm, We Don't Talk About Bruno. My apologies to everyone in this room for whom the mere mention of Bruno has put the song on a repeating loop in your head. The song is from Encanto, a film from last year which tells the story of Mirabelle, a young woman who is trying to find a place as the only member of her family without superpowers. Each family member has been gifted with a different ability. Uh, she has a sister who is super strong, an aunt who controls the weather, and Mirabelle has no powers, so her family thinks and they shun and ignore her. Mirabelle's uncle, Bruno, is also shunned, though, for different reasons. He has the ability to see the future. His power was so upsetting to the people around him that eventually he went into hiding. And by the time Mirabelle was a teenager, his name had become a taboo. When she brings him up, she is quickly told, we don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. When my two-year-old twins somehow have already learned that you have to do this when you sing no, 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 no. It's very cute. Of course, as soon as they say that, they launch into this jaunty ditty that is all about him, so I'm not sure this technically counts as a taboo. In this week's Torah portion, we encounter a Bruno, a guy we'd rather not talk about. At first, at first blush, his story seems so distasteful, so out of step with our values, that a reform rabbi like me tends to just avoid him completely. Which is easy to do because later in the parsha we get the story of the daughters of Zalafchad, the closest thing the Torah has to feminist icons, so we usually just preach about that. But if you want to hear my sermon about them, you're going to have to stick around for Warehouse Shabbat later tonight. Here, now, I'm going to break the taboo. We need to talk about Pinchas. At the end of last week's parsha, we're told that God had sent a plague because a bunch of Israelite men had been led astray by a group of Moabite women who seduced them into acts of adultery and idolatry. In the midst of this plague, one Israelite priest, Pinchas, spots another nobleman named Zimri engaged in a scandalous act with a woman named Cosby, and he takes matters into his own hands. He follows them to their tent, and he runs them both through with a spear. This act of murderous zealotry would be offensive enough, but what happens next is even more upsetting. Last week's Parsha ends with the plague subsiding. Then, in this week's portion, which is named for Pinchas, God says, Pinchas has turned my, back my wrath by displaying his passion for me, so that I did not wipe out the Israelite people in my passion. Therefore, I grant him my brit shalom, a covenant of peace. God gave Pinchas and his descendants a special role in the priesthood, leaving no question Pinchas' violent act was praiseworthy. It earned him a special covenant with God, a covenant of peace, no less. What are we going to do about that? You can see why I'd much rather preach about the daughters of Zalafchad. But alas, as Maribel's family learns, at some point you're going to have to talk about Bruno. I am troubled by God's praise for Pinchas' religious zeal. Does God want me to be like Pinchas? But what upsets me most is the reason for Pinchas' extrajudicial execution. What ignites his zealous rage is, essentially, an interfaith relationship. As a reform rabbi deeply committed to building a diverse and loving Jewish community, I cannot abide by that. I would delete this text from our Torah if I could, but I can't. So instead, I must wrestle with it for some meaning. The historian, Simon Ravidovich, calls the Jews the ever-dying people. By that, he means that the belief that unites every generation of Jews is the fear that they will be the last generation of Jews. Of course, every generation of Jews until now has been wrong about that belief, and yet this fear has shaped Jewish life from the Torah until now. 
This is the fear that motivates Pinchas to appoint himself judge, jury, and executioner. He sees someone who he believes might prevent the Jews from surviving long enough to even enter the promised land, and he moves to eliminate the threat before it spreads like a plague. He acts as gatekeeper, deciding for everyone what is acceptable for Jews and slamming the door closed on anyone he deems outside the boundaries. When I was coming of age in the Jewish community of the 80s and 90s, Jewish continuity were the buzzwords in every conversation. Billions of dollars were invested because my parents' generation was sure that they would be the first generation of the ever-dying people to actually be right. And one of the main targets of their efforts was interfaith marriage. I remember when I was growing up, it was always framed as the problem of intermarriage. And many of them chose to act as gatekeepers like Pinchas, taking it upon themselves to decide who was in and who was out. I remember my childhood rabbi giving sermons on the high holy days about this threat. I pride myself on being a very different rabbi than him, at least when it comes to this issue. Because I know that interfaith families are not a threat to Jewish continuity, but I would argue essential to it. Recent studies have shown that the intermarriage rate among non-Orthodox Jews is 72%. Jewish communities that draw the gates tightly closed, excluding these families, do so at their peril. But it is more than just a numbers game. Interfaith, or some call them Jewish plus families, contribute to the vibrancy of this community. Many non-Jewish parents are the ones driving their kids to religious school. Many people see themselves as a part of the Jewish community even if they were not born Jewish, even if they have no intention or interest in conversion. These are folks that, have, that we have come to call Jewish adjacent, the people who love, support, and sustain Jews and Jewish communities because that is where they feel at home. It only occurred to me years later that when my childhood rabbi was railing against interfaith marriage on Yom Kippur, he was preaching to a room that included non-Jews who had come that holy day, maybe to pray, and maybe out of an act of love for their Jewish family. This is why an increasing number of Reform and Reconstructionist clergy are choosing to perform interfaith weddings under various circumstances, and why some conservative rabbis are too. We know the power that comes from welcoming these Jewish plus families into communities of meaning and purpose. Heck, more than half of my rabbinical school classmates had a non-Jewish parent. They understood better than any generation of rabbis before them what is possible when we act as greeters, not gatekeepers. They understood that our diversity is our superpower, not a threat to it. Believing you are an ever-dying people authorizes people to be gatekeepers. Sometimes they are minding the gates because they think they must keep others out. Sometimes they are minding the gates to keep people in. But neither works, because in truth we are not dying. We are thriving. Each generation in new ways. It was a damaging philosophy for Pinchas, and it's damaging in our day too. I am so proud of the work we do here to create a sense of sacred belonging for all, including the many Jewish adjacent people who make our community thrive. I am proud this year to be a Rukin Rabbinical Fellow with the 18 Doors organization, a nonprofit committed to making the Jewish community more welcoming to Jewish plus families. Over the next two years, I know I will learn many lessons that will help push our sacred belonging work even further. And I am proud to have been selected as the faculty person for Houston's first Honeymoon Israel trip in November, a program which brings young, predominantly interfaith couples together for a low-cost trip to Israel. And I know we still have more work to do. There are still places where we act as gatekeepers, either as a community or as individuals. We still have places where we make assumptions, where we other, where we isolate. My challenge for all of us who are committed to sustaining this congregation as a vibrant and loving community is that we see ourselves as greeters at the gate, where we do not assume that everyone in this room is Jewish, but we do ensure that everyone in this room knows they belong here. Each of us can open doors to Jewish life for each other. That's as much your job as it is mine. In the end, perhaps even Pinchas took on this job. In the Torah scroll, where God promises the Brit Shalom, the covenant of peace, the Vav in Shalom is lit, written with a little break in the middle. It is a reminder that the peace created through zealous gatekeeping is a broken 
peace. There is even a tradition that Pinchas is another name for Elijah, the prophet we invite to every bris and baby naming and Passover Seder. It's our way of showing him how wrong he was about the Jews being an ever-dying people, how Jewish life and Jewish creativity have thrived and grown in each generation. I like to think that Pinchas has come to see the error of his ways, that he gets a particular joy at sitting at a Seder table of families full of Jews and Jewish adjacent folks celebrating their freedom together, that he finds unique delight in the bris or baby naming where one parent is not Jewish but still joyously brings their child into this covenant. And in that way, the vav, the shalom, the peace is repaired. It's a lesson Pinchas would have also learned by watching the movie Encanto. Mirabelle's family wanted to keep her at a distance because she was different, and they deemed her less special, and so they decided that she was a threat to their magic. But what they learn is that they did not understand her unique power, her empathy, and ability, ability to see each member of her family for who they truly were. What they learn is that they cannot thrive without her. And it is, her exclu it is their exclusion of her that most threatens their magic. For too long, we have slammed doors in the faces of Mirabelle's who we perceive as too different or not special enough to be a part of our community. But now we are called to recognize that each person comes here with their own unique gifts. It is our job to see and celebrate them. It is our job to ensure that this enchanted house that we call a synagogue is big enough for all who want to be here, for all who call us family. Shabbat Shalom.